Good afternoon. Welcome to this session on sustainable scaling of Kubernetes workloads with in-place pod resize using predictive AI. Uh, I am Vinay. I work for eBay Cloud, where I'm helping build eBPF-powered Kubernetes networking uh, at global scale for large clusters with a lot of pods. Uh, Haran, please introduce yourself. Hi, everyone. I'm Haran. I'm currently a PhD student at the UIUC, and I'm working on microservices and the cloud resource management with machine learning. Thank you. Thank you, Haran. So the agenda for today, uh, we'll start by describing the over-provisioning problem and look at the environmental impact and the dollar cost of over-provisioning. Uh, we, touch, we touch upon our roadmap and outline why this is important for eBay and quickly recap the in-place pod resize feature. We'll also look at the cluster auto-scaler use case and see how in-place pod resize can help improve it. And we then switch gears and Haran will walk us through the current state of AI in the cloud. Uh, we'll take a look at the role that reinforcement learning can play in auto-scaling and see how AI can help us go from being reactive to being proactive with auto-scaling. And to conclude, we'll look at how RL training is done and review evaluation results. So accurately estimating what resources your pod needs is a very hard problem. Um, those of you who container, containerized your apps in Kubernetes may have come to the resources section of the YAML and wondered, gee, how much CPU do I need? Uh, how much memory do I need for my pod or how much storage? And um, these are, uh, this makes it hard and it's a challenging problem and um, for various reasons. The Java apps that use uh, CPU, there's, excuse me, for example, Java apps use more CPU at startup time and consume a fraction of the initial CPU during normal run times. Uh, so if you use fixed limit for a guaranteed QoS class pod, it means choosing between a slow startup or over provisioning. You could get the over provisioning, you could get the provisioning right, but still be subject to load shocks uh, due to external factors such as other pods going down or the load balance, road ba load balancer misbehaving. Your code may take slower paths more often due to varying nature of the requests, and uh, the services that you depend on may experience outages causing, causing uh, your service to get backed up with requests. And if you do everything right, if you get the provisioning right, you profile your uh, code with real traffic and use VPA recommender, perfectly tune the load balancer and HPA, well, as of today, k 8 does not allow you to mutate your pod resources out of the box So, in order to deal with changes. So there's not a lot that you can control. And over-provisioning comes with a cost. First, uh, there is the environmental impact. Steven Mazra did a case study two years ago when cryptocurrency mania was in full swing. He estimated that a single data center consumed the power equivalent of 50,000 homes. That crypto energy hunger is now being replaced by AI energy needs, and AI workloads tend to be compute intensive and network intensive. Data centers also have significant cooling needs. They require a lot of water. And then there is the CO2 emissions impact, and there is the noise and electronic waste that comes with it. So why should we care? It's simple, because there is no planet B. And then, of course, there is a dollar cost to over-provisioning. Uh, Jay Chappell, in a blog, estimated that $26.6 billion were wasted cloud spending in 2021. And he found that 40% of IaaS instances were over-allocated, which tallied to $8.7 billion in uh, overspend. In another report, a vendor named Cast AI estimated that 37% of computer resources allocated were never used. And Last year, a company named Stormforce did a survey where people responded that 47% of the cloud waste was from over-provisioning. They also felt that, majority of the respondents also felt that Kubernetes complexity was a contributing factor. Now, the theme is that about half the resources are wasted. And in a nutshell, this is an expensive problem and this affects the bottom line for companies. And in the end, it impacts consumer wallets. But it also means that we have an opportunity here to do better. Sustainability has been an important business goal at eBay. When, the, when your business is about finding new purpose for once loved but abandoned items, reuse and sustainability comes naturally. 
specifically at the data center level, that uh, dollar five fifty shipping seals the deal for me. Uh, specifically at the data center level, the goal is exclusive renewable energy use. HPA with predictive AI to better estimate the replication needs is an ongoing effort at this time. And next year, there are plans to take up VPA to right-size pods and containers. And this is where in-place pod resize is an important piece of the puzzle as it avoids workload disruption due to vertical scaling and the overhead of scheduling new pods and starting them up. Eventually, we want to get to, sorry, we eventually want to get to, We want to get to the uh, multi-dimensional pod auto scaling. Now, in place pod resize, up until earlier this year, you could not edit the resources given to your pod. You had to restart your workload if you wanted to change its resources. And then finally, we merged. Finally, we merged the pull request in Kubernetes 127 that enables us to use uh, enables us to resize pod without disruption. I have a blog that you can visit to learn more about this feature and how to use it. I presented a detailed design about this in a talk last year. The field names in the API have changed slightly since, but the core design that was presented remains the same. And if you're interested in the gory details, there is a link to the CAP. Uh, CAP stands for Kubernetes Enhancement Proposal. That's our design document. One application of in-place pod resize with sustainability benefits came from a recent blog post by Peter Minkowski. He noticed that Java apps needed a lot more CPU during startup time than when doing regular work, as I mentioned earlier. So if you have a guaranteed QoS class pod with hard CPU limits optimized for the runtime need, it would result in long startup times. And the alternative is over-provisioning. In this use case, he resizes the CPU limits lower after the app startup phase was complete. And this means a job can start and finish faster and we can power down unneeded nodes sooner. And AKA, it helps you become energy conscious and cost conscious. So cluster or scaler mainly does two things for us. Number one, it scales up clusters when pods are pending due to insufficient resources and it scales down clusters by removing underutilized nodes. Consider this scenario. Uh, you have Kubernetes cluster and a couple of uh, nodes in there, and they are at capacity running pods. A couple of new pods show up. They are pending due to lack of resources, and they will remain pending until some pods finish and free up some room. Cluster Autoscaler sees this and calls into the Cloud Provider API to allocate a new node. Then the scheduler can then assign these pending pods to that new node. The issue with this is that Cluster Autoscaler only considers the pod resource requests. It does not take into account the resource utilization of running pods before allocating new nodes. This also means that your cluster could be very underutilized, yet you end up bringing new nodes online. In other words, your carbon footprint goes up and you waste money. Let's have a quick look at how Cluster Autoscaler works today. I'm going to use, uh, this is using QVDM Cloud Provider, and uh, I'm going to play a pre-recorded demo for this part. I apologize if people in the back find it hard to see, but there is an uploaded video for this as well. This is a demo of Cluster Autoscaling with QVDM as Cloud Provider. In this demo, we have a simple cluster with two nodes, a master and a node called Node 1, and we have two pods that are running on Node 1. Taking a closer look at Node 1, we see that pod 1 has requested 1 CPU and pod 2 has requested 500 milli CPUs. We also note that this node has 2 CPUs allocatable and a capacity of 2 CPUs. These pods are idle though. And if we want to schedule one more pod that requests one more CPU, it's not going to be able to schedule because there's not enough room in the cluster even though the cluster is underutilized. Let's start the pod. When we create the pod, we see that one more pod is up in the API and it's pending. And it will remain pending until there is more room in the cluster. Let's take a look at the reason. We do a k-describe pod on this pod. 
and in the events we see it's failed scheduling and the reason is insufficient CPU. In order to connect more CPU, we will add a new node to the cluster using kubeadm cloud provider. With this YAML file, we can deploy the cloud provider and this cloud provider is going to listen for requests to scale up the cluster on the local host address at port 8086. So now that we have deployed the pod, the cluster, the kubeadm cloud provider is up and running. And if we look at the logs, we see that it's listening at the localhost address port 8086. Next, we start the cluster autoscaler. We tell the cluster autoscaler how to reach the cloud provider by providing this config file, which just points to the address to the cloud provider that we just started. So now we start the cluster autoscaler. It's going to connect to the API and see that there is a pod pending and it's going to request a scale up of the cluster with the kubeadm cloud provider. There is the request for scale up and the kubeadm cloud provider has added a new node. This node is up and running and that will be reflected in the API and the scheduler will see that a new node is up and running shortly and when it does that it will look to schedule this pending pod. And there we go. The pending pod is now up and running. This concludes the demo of kubeadm as cloud provider for cluster auto scaling. Okay, I'm glad that didn't crash. So uh, what you saw is just a vanilla cluster auto scaler. Uh, we allocated new node and then we scheduled this pod on that new node, node two, even though node one is underutilized. And uh, that's what motivated this talk today and uh, sets the basis for the next demo we're gonna show in a little bit. Now let's look at what we can do differently with in-place pod resize. What we have now is the ability to quickly resize the pod without disruption. So that means pod disruption budgets are not an issue. We can make a small tweak to the cluster autoscaler logic where uh, we instead of immediately requesting a new node from the cloud provider, we check to see if current pods can be resized down. And if we can do that, we and we can create some more room, then we end up we end up uh, scheduling the pod without firing up new nodes and we save some money and we, we become more sustainable. What does this look like in terms of the code change? Well, it's still a very simple tweak. What we do is we arm the, cl arm the cluster autoscaler with what I call as a pod smusher. Uh, the difference is that we check that in this case, the pods that are underutilized, we scale them, we shrink them before we scale up the cluster. Now, what does this look like? For this, we'll switch to a live demo because I'm feeling adventurous. Let's see how that goes. So you have the same setup as before. You have uh, two, nodes, two nodes here, the master and node one. We have a few pods running. There is the kubeadm cloud provider pod that's uh, standing by to receive requests to scale up the cluster if need be. And there are those are pods, pod one and pod two, which are uh, underutilized. They, uh, they're tailing the null device, so they're really doing nothing. Uh, if you look at the node, we see that pod one is, has requested one CPU and pod two has requested 500 milli CPUs in a node that has uh, allocatable of two CPUs and a capacity of two CPUs. These pods are great candidates to be resized down and that's what we will do in this case. You can see here that pod one is uh, also requesting one C has a request of one CPU and allocation of one CPU by the kubelet when we do uh, the, describe the pod and get its container status allocated resources, a new feature that was added in in-place pod resize. Uh, next, if we want to schedule one more pod as before, which requests one more CPU, it won't be able to schedule just as before. So let's do that. I'm gonna create this pod in the API and it's showing up in the API. 
it's pending as before, and the reason it's pending is I'm going to do a k describe pod, and in the events we see that it has failed scheduling, and the reason is insufficient CPU. Now, this time around though, we are going to do something slightly different. Instead of running our vanilla cluster auto scaler, we are going to run this pod smusher cluster auto scaler which is hard-coded to resize down pod 1 to 200 milli CPUs. So let's hit it. So now it's going to connect to the API and there we go. It has detected that a pod is pending, but before resizing the cluster, it checked it can uh, smush pod 1 to 200 milli CPUs. And we'll look, look at this again. Now we are at 200 milli CPUs for pod one, and we see that one more pod has now been scheduled, but this time it's scheduled on node one because we created room by shrinking that pod, and we did not need to allocate node two. So thus, we saved some money. So that, uh, that's In a demo, demo for uh, the second case with the in-place pod resize. Now, does this mean we are done? Well, not quite. There are many ways this could go wrong. Uh, let's look at a couple of ways things can play out in ways you do not expect. You just took away memory from a pod that's known to get ohm kill during spikes and a spike is about to occur. Or that idle CPU you repurposed for degrades the shopping experience for your site users later when a bad job starts. We can speculate all day about the different ways in which things could go wrong, but the real question to ask is, can we as humans come up with a smarter set of heuristics? Sure, we can, but if we had infinite time, but then is there a better way than that? Well, it turns out there is. Making recommendations based on a large set of parameters in a reasonable amount of time, in a reasonable amount of time is a job best suited for, <laughs> keep messing this up, uh, making recommendations based on a large set of parameters in a reasonable amount of time is a task best suited for AI. Uh, so let's hear from Aaron how AI can help. Take it away, Aaron. Thank you, Rene. Oops. So let's step back a little bit, looking at the cloud platforms, and you may find that general resource management is actually everywhere in cloud platforms. Workload auto scaling is one example, and others include job scheduling, VM or container placement, congestion control, etc. And such problems have been around for a long time, both in theory and in practice, but yet remain significantly challenging. Currently, most are relying on human-engineered heuristics. On the other hand, we have learning-based approaches such as reinforcement learning which allows us to use deep neural networks to express the complex dynamics with raw and noisy signals and to express the decision-making policies. Learning-based approaches are available because we have abundant data generated in modern cloud platforms. Examples include monitoring data, system metrics, application performance metrics, and those are there due to the improvement of observability tools. So let's look at what people do today for those system management tasks. There are two main categories, human engineering and reinforcement learning-based approaches, representing the learning-based solutions. But actually, at a higher level, they share similarities. So here I make a side-by-side -side comparison. On the left-hand side, we have human-driven engineering. People usually start with a simple system model based on, for example, Kuhn theory and they need to manually produce some heuristics or parameters to make it work. And of course, we need to test and tune those parameters with extensive profiling based on for, uh, like until relatively good heuristics are found, and usually for the average case. And whenever there's any changes to the applications or the cloud platforms, we need to redo these steps again and again. On the other hand, there is an opportunity for using learning-based solutions such as reinforcement learning, where an artificial agent is created to interact with the environment. And the system management task is usually formulated as a Markov decision process, essentially a sequential decision-making process. And the agent starts from a random policy, 
This policy maps from the states to the actions and is usually parameterized by neural networks. At each, each time step, it obtains states, make an action, and then gets the reward, indicating how good the action is given the current context. And this policy will be optimized based on the reward. As you can see, this is also like a loop, and it will continue until convergence, or there's no improvement when updating the model parameters. There are two main reasons why learning-based approaches, such as IO, is suitable for cloud system management. The first reason is that it provides a systematic framework for automatic retraining to reduce repeated human-driven profiling and tuning. And secondly, it reduces costly optimization or search to constant time, which makes it scalable to the large state action space in dynamic cloud environment for heterogeneous applications. As a primer, IO is an approach that falls in between supervised learning and unsupervised learning. It doesn't require any labeled data, but needs a reward. An agent interacts with the environment in a step-by-step -step manner. At each time step t, it's going to get a state st, make an action at, and then receive the reward rt. As I mentioned, the reward here serves as the feedback, like the loss function, which directs the IO policy or model training. And the goal of our action training is to maximize the expected cumulative reward in any t-step trajectory. So let's look at how we formulate the workload auto scaling task as an IO problem. In the Kubernetes cluster, application workloads are usually deployed as pods or containers to continuously meet application SLOs and achieve high resource utilization. The IO-based auto scaler is responsible for auto scaling. Uh, like in a vertical dimension, such as resizing the container regarding the CPU and the memory limit, and the horizontal scaling to adjust the number of containers. With the IL, we get rid of human-driven application profiling and parameter tuning in heuristic-based approaches. For example, in threshold-based auto-scaling, the, op the optimal threshold for CPU utilization without violating the application performance SLOs actually varies across different applications or platforms. And IL automates policy learning with a systematic and dynamic feedback control loop. To support IL training and inference in Kubernetes, we have a multi-dimensional pod auto scaler or MPA. The design of MPA actually follows the similar style of VPA that separates scaling recommendation from actuation. By doing so, it supports customized plug-and-play multi-dimensional auto-scalers, such as IO. First, we have application deployments and metric servers in the Kubernetes cluster, and then MP recommenders gets the measurements from the metric servers and gets the scaling recommendations from either the IO agent from Avarkis or the traditional VPA or HPA controllers. The recommender then sets the scaling configurations in the MPA API, and then the updater operator executes the horizontal or vertical scaling recommendation configuration updates. Here, we took the open source implementation from Firm, which has been published in OSDI 2020 as the IO-based auto scaler, which is a proactive approach, meaning that the IO agent decides how to auto scale to react to the perceived states such as the current utilization or the current application performance metrics. But we can make it a proactive auto scaling approach by prepending a predictor following the way that deep scaling is doing, which has been published in SOCC last year. Instead of taking the current uh, measurement, like the time series data, the predictor forecasts the next time windows time series data on utilization and loads, and then pass it to the IR agent to make the decision. For the IO agent, it's really just trained to make resource reprovation decisions directly from experience. And it is optimized for the end-to-end -end objectives. What does that mean? As I mentioned, the reward function in IO acts as the loss function to point the IO agent to the right direction. And the reward function, in our case, is defined as this function. It basically consists of two parts. The first part means to mitigate SLO violations fast. In this case, SMT is the SLO maintenance at time t. 
and it's defined as the SLO latency divided by the current latency. A lower value means worse performance degradation, and we give it like a penalty by having lower reward. The second part is to avoid over-provisioning. It's defined as the resource usage at time t divided by the assigned resource limit or allocation. A higher value means high resource utilization efficiency and less over-provisioning. And this aligns with our objectives in an end-to-end -end manner. And with data evaluations on microservices deployed on Kubernetes, overall, we found that IO-based auto scaler reduces the SLO violation mitigation time by up to nine times compared with baseline Kubernetes auto scalers. Breaking it up, it reduces the average tail latency by up to 11 times, while reducing the overall requested CPU limit by up to 62%. In the meantime, it reduces the number of dropped requests or timeout requests in the microservice applications by up to eight times. So to summarize our talk today, we saw that cloud computing comes with a significant amount of environmental impact and dollar cost. Thankfully, in-place pod resize feature helps us drive towards the goal of multi-dimensional pod auto-scaling. We also look at how reinforcement learning helps us further improve the efficiency, which has played a very promising role in Kubernetes auto-scaling. It saves us from the laborious work, and it also helps us from being reactive to proactive. Our next steps were to drive the in-place pod resize feature to JA and realize cost saving and reduce the carbon footprint via holistic auto scaling. And we could use community to help with this. Here is a list of references whose work helped us put together this talk, including several papers I mentioned in the talk. And we would like to hear back from you so that we can learn what we could do better. Please scan this QR code. It will take you to, uh, to the place where you can leave us feedback. And with that, we will conclude this talk and open this session for Q&A. Okay. Thank you. So if you have any questions, please come up to the mic over there, and uh, we can answer them to you. Really neat stuff, appreciate it. Could you, you back up one slide so we can get the references? <laughs> oh. <laughs> I have uploaded the slides to Sked so you can get it from there too. Hi, this is Abhishek from IPM Research. Hi, Arun. Uh, so I have two questions. Um, we covered a little bit about uh, AI workload use case. So the first question is, GPUs currently are expressed in Kubernetes as fixed integer quantities. How would scale down work in that aspect? And the second question is again regarding uh, the AI workload use case. Most of these workloads have gang scheduling semantics. So will this uh, technology help in uh, resizing gangs of pods that are related to a single application? Currently, uh, let me take the first question out there. The GPU workloads, yes, they are they are currently uh, they are shown up as, they are showing up as extended resources, and the spec that we have today for in-place pod resize only covers CPU and memory. It does not cover extended resources today, and that was mainly a decision to keep the scope in check. And uh, it's a large project as it is. Uh, a future cap is welcome uh, that can you know scale up and scale down GPUs. Um, I don't know if that could benefit from uh, in-place pod resize kind of, whether it depends on whether you want it in units of one or you want it smaller than that. Uh, but I can see that potentially being one of the things that come in extended resources. You want to scale the number of GPUs that you have for your pod up and down. Yeah, uh, that could be there. Uh, and uh, regarding, regarding the second question, let me think. The scheduling approach that we have today uh, with in-place pod resize doesn't really, it's, it's not even assisting, it just observes. And this has come up, uh, scheduler could potentially come up as uh, something that can assist. What it does today for, is that it steers new pods that are coming away from nodes that are requesting resize. So that way resize gets a little bit of priority. Uh, as far as gang scheduling, whether we're gonna 
take that into the scope of in-place pod, in pod resize. Um, I don't see that happening anytime soon, but uh, if you have a strong proposal of requirements and a cap in mind, that's totally welcome. Uh, the community would love to see that, and uh, we want to get uh, it's we want we want to get community review. These are fairly big uh, asks because it scales across multiple components. You are scaling across. You need to change the API. You need to change the scheduler, Kubelet, all critical components of Kubernetes. So they will go through thorough reviews. Thanks, Vinay. Um, thanks for the talk, really interesting. I was curious, when you're doing your reinforcement learning, um, are you training that against a live cluster, or do you have some sort of like simulation environment that you're doing the training in, or what does that look like? Yeah, thanks for the question. So, so the question is, during the reinforcement learning agent training, are we using the live cluster or a simulator? Uh, so actually, in this experiment, we are using a live cluster creating the, uh, de first deploy the microservice benchmarks on the cluster, and then deploy the workload generator to drive the microservices running to serve the request. And then the reinforced learning agent training act is actually happening by interacting with the MPA, like setting scaling recommendations, and then receive the feedback. Yes. Cool, thanks. Thank you. Hello, thank you for the session. Uh, I'm Febin, and I'm from a healthcare domain. So uh, with not auto scaling, will not selector chains and tolerations uh, will be considered while this uh, auto scaling is performed? So um, uh, let me take the first part of the question. There, there are two. I think there are two part answers to this. Uh, the first one is uh, uh, vertical scaling, in place vertical scaling. That is after scheduling. So chains and tolerations don't really come into play here. Uh, with regards to multi-dimensional pod auto scaling, the author of that uh, cap is standing right next to me, and uh, I'll let him answer that question. Uh, so, uh, could you repeat the question? Is it asked okay? About? So, uh, while you do the aut not auto scaling, yes, will the not selector uh, pod affinity rules and uh, chains and tolerations? will that be taken into consideration, mainly when you scale it down? Uh, scaling down, so, so you're asking? When you remove a pod, sorry, when you remove a node from the cluster. Uh, yeah, I'm trying to understand. So you're asking uh, when we are scaling down the resource limit? Yeah, so let me tell you this. Um, two or more than one pod an application has like only two pods, and um, you are scaling the node down. Yes. And uh, these uh, you only have like two nodes with a certain node uh, node selector, and the pods can run only on those two nodes. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah. I see. So, so you're asking like uh, when there's a constraint that the pods can only run it on those two nodes, mm -hmm. but there is no like capacity on those two nodes? Like what do you do with so, that? Uh, so, no, the capacity is there on the two nodes. Actually, the one of the node is underutilized, so you don't have that node to be on the cluster, and you decide to scale it down, remove the node from the cluster. Oh, so let me, let me take that question. So the current cluster auto scaler, the way it works, I think it takes into consideration if a pod can be evicted. If a pod cannot be evicted, we won't get a scale down. Uh, okay. But frankly, I think the current cluster auto scaler, we are, uh, the auto scaling community is looking to replace it with the Carpenter. And let's see if that gives us more features. Thank you. Correct, yeah. No, it's a node. But they said the node also, right? You had the I node. I think for disruption budget, will stop it, the yes. yeah. scan and I wanted to know what all things are taken into consideration. Uh, yeah, uh, but that's good. No. No, yeah. It just changes the sizing. Thank you. 
Thank you for your tremendous work. Uh, as someone operating solely on, on prem, I've been like uh, looking at this proposal for three years, and every time it hasn't met the release uh, milestone, it was like Christmas <laughs> taken back from me. So, uh, my question is: You are uh, uh, performing reinforced learning on actual good data, but in practice, we are then operating in environments with microservices where the reward function and the metrics of reward function could be heavily impacted not only by the performance of the service itself, but rather by the performance of dependencies like databases or performance of other services that are dependencies for this one, upstream and downstream performances. So what are your uh, ideas on how we can incorporate the filtering of the latency or other reward uh, uh, targets that could smooth out the impact of not the decisions made by the uh, reinforced learner autoscaler itself, but about uh, around the environment. Is it clear? Uh. So let, let me repeat the question. So you are saying in microservices, there could be always third party services like databases. And uh, how can we isolate the root cause for SLO violations? Yeah, so how can we, in the end of the day, stop the uh, our autoscaler to trigger any kind of uh, excessive upscaling or downscaling, uh -huh. which is not actually correlated with the decisions yeah. made previously, because there, there is noise in, in this kind of environment. Yeah, 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 that's a good question. So actually, we, uh, like, if you, if you check out our, our paper there, like the number, number eight here, so actually, we, we treat the microservices like a graph. So we first uh, use uh, tracing tools like Jaeger to first uh, nail down what's the root cause candidate for those SLO violations. So if it's not the uh, microservice A, then we are gonna only focus on the root cause uh, for the SLO violations. And then the SLO, and then the, our agent only focus on that particular microservice component, but not on all the microservices at the same time. So by doing that, we are not like excessively scaling up some you know, uh, peripheral, some uh, microservices, but only targeting the root cause candidates. Uh, I have extra questions, but I think I just first need to check the, the yeah, paper here. Yeah, feel free to shoot me questions. Thank you. Uh, okay, we're, we are out of time, uh, so I think we need to stop now. Uh, we can certainly hang around outside and then take more questions, if that's okay. All right. Thank you, guys. Thank you very much for coming.